ladies and gentlemen, welcome. What a wonderful house for a superb discussion tonight. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret uh, tonight. This is the only institution in America <laughs> chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. Thank you very uh, much indeed. Um, what exciting programs we have coming up over the next few weeks. Next week, May 10th, the history and legacy of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution turns 150 this year. We've got this wonderful grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to celebrate its constitutional legacy, and we have the leading judges and scholars in America from both sides of the aisle to talk about the history and contemporary legacy of the 14th Amendment. Uh, on May 26th, the next Supreme Court confirmation battle will include both a panel of scholars and historians talking about the nomination battle over Merrick Garland, as well as a debate uh, on that topic. I have to share with you, please check out online, just last week at the U.S. Capitol, we launched our Senatorial Visiting Scholars Program, where Senators Mike Lee and Chris Coons agreed to be the first National Constitution Center of Visiting Scholars, and we sat in the Senate, and I interviewed them, and we had a mini debate about whether the, the Senate has a constitutional duty to hold hearings, and then they agreed about the constitutional aspects of NSA surveillance. It's an incredible video, and we're going to rehearse that question on May 26th. June 1st, the thrilling and riveting book launch of <laughs> Louis D. Brandeis' American Prophet. I just got the actual books. They just came in, and they look so uh, beautiful, and I can't wait to share them uh, with you. And then on June 8th, Intelligence Squares re Squared returns here for the important constitutional debate. Has the president usurped Congress's congressional power? It's going to be an incredible spring. Okay, tonight, we celebrate the life and examine the legacy of one of the most influential Supreme Court justices of the 20th century, uh, 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 Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, we have an extraordinary panel to do that. They include uh, former clerks for Justice Scalia, as well as America's leading scholars and intellectuals about uh, originalism, which was Justice Scalia's methodology. Really, there's, it's impossible to imagine a better group to discuss Justice Scalia's legacy, and I'm going to briefly tell you who they are. Stephen Calabresi, the Clayton and Henry Barber Professor of Law at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, uh, was a clerk for Justice Scalia. He was a co-founder of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy, and he is, uh, sits on the National Constitution Center's Coalition of Freedom Advisory Board, which oversees our extraordinary interactive constitution. He is a magnificent friend of the center. Uh, Lee Otis, the senior vice president and faculty division director of the Federalist Society, is a co-chair of the interactive constitution. And she and her counterpart, Carolyn Fredrickson, the head of the American Constitution Society, are nominating all of the scholars who are producing these incredible explainers about every clause of the Constitution. She has been a special assistant and an associate deputy attorney general at the US Department of Justice, and also was a clerk for then Judge Scalia on the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit in 1983 and 1984. And then she clerked for Justice Scalia in the first year of his appointment to the court. Uh, and she also helped start the University of Chicago's Federalist Society in 1982. So Lee and, and Steve are really the founding, the, the, the founders of the Federalist Society, such uh, helping oversee the interactive constitution and are just extraordinarily thoughtful on these questions. Um, as if that's not enough, Kevin Walsh is professor of law at the University of Richmond School of Law, where he teaches federal jurisdiction and constitutional law. He also clerked for Justice Scalia, as well as for Judge Paul Niemeyer. He's participated in Constitution Center podcasts and debates and is doing wonderful work with us uh, in his capacity as uh, a head of the John Marshall uh, Society. And uh, finally, we're very lucky to have Brian Garad, who is the Constitutional Accountability Center's chief counsel. Uh, Brian was a law clerk for Judge Stephen Breyer and Supreme Court uh, Justice Judge Robert Katzman. So we have three uh, Scalia clerks and a Breyer clerk. Uh, but uh, Brian is um, chief counsel for this great organization and great friend of the Constitution Center that believes that constitutional text and original understanding 
can often lead to progressive rather than conservative results. And we are gonna have a wonderful debate uh, and discussion about the effort by liberals to apply Justice Scalia's legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can do it all in one breath, please join me in welcoming Steve Calabresi, Lee Otis, Kevin Walsh, and Brian Garad. Just to get everyone straight, Kevin, Lee, Steve, and Brian. So excited that you're here. Steve, you uh, clerk for Justice Scalia. You have called him the most influential judge of the 20th century. I want to just start by, by humanizing him. You've got some, some really funny stories uh, involving him. Tell us the one that we were doing in the green room. Sure. Um, Justice Scalia had a tremendous sense of humor and was very lively. and loved to tell stories that were to some extent jokes at his own expense. I first learned this when he was nominated to be a judge on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. When you're nominated for a judgeship, the FBI routinely does a background check on you where they send field agents around to talk to everyone you know, your neighbors, your co-employees, et cetera, to make sure there's nothing unsavory in your past that would make you unsuitable for a government job. And it turned out that Justice Scalia, during the time he was teaching at the University of Chicago Law School, had been not attending mass at the Catholic chapel at the University of Chicago, which he thought was too liberal in its ways. And so he was instead going to mass at a small Catholic chapel in the Italian-American neighborhood of Chicago. He went to Mass one day in April of 1982, and on his way out the door, the priest hugged at his sleeve and said, Nino, you've got to stay behind. I've got to talk to you. So they waited for everybody to leave, and the priest, with a look of terror in his face, said to Justice Scalia, Nino, I've got terrible, terrible news for you. It's, it's the FBI. They're after you. They were crawling all over here yesterday, asking everyone every question they could think of. And then he paused and said, but Nino, don't worry. I told them nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a few years later, when I was working as a law clerk to him, I was uh, in a spat with one of my fellow law clerks that uh, seemed to me sufficiently, sufficiently serious so that I needed to complain to Justice Scalia about it. And so I went to the justice's office and patiently, he sat patiently behind the desk and heard my disagreement with my co-clerk. And he shook his head resignedly and said, it must be terrible to have disagreements with people in the workplace. <laughs> 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 and fi finally, and most recently, about, uh, oh, maybe about seven, eight or nine years ago, he was uh, talking about the importance of not televising Supreme Court oral arguments because it meant that he was more, more or less anonymous and he could move around the country unseen and unnoticed and that he had a lot of privacy as a result. And he said, for example, just this past summer, I was driving cross country with one of my sons and we checked into a motel in Kansas for the night. And I went up to the desk, and the desk clerk said, uh, what do you want? And he said, I'd like to uh, reserve a room for the night. And the desk clerk said, what's your name? And he said, Scalia. And the desk clerk said, you're going to have to spell that one for me. <laughs> so he spelled it out. And the desk clerk wrote it down and looked at it and said, oh, Scalia just like the Supreme Court justice. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he, he was hilariously funny and fun to be with, and I will miss him for that reason alone very greatly. Those are wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. Lee, you and Steve both helped found the Federalist Society, which has done so much to enrich intellectual debate in America, and Justice Scalia was an inspiration Tell us what his role was. You were a clerk for him on the lower court. He was coming up with the idea of originalism at the time. So what was the connection between Justice Scalia and the founding of the Federalist Society and how he helped inspire it? Um, so when we were starting the Federalist Society, actually, uh, we didn't know we were starting the Federalist Society, for starters. Um, Steve and I each thought we were starting a group 
at each of our law schools. I thought I was starting a group at the University of Chicago Law School, and Steve thought he was starting a group at Yale. And um, Steve came up with the idea of calling it the Federalist Society, and I thought, that sounds like a good, good idea. I'm going to steal that name. Um, so I, we had the Federalist Society of Chicago. But, um, I was asked, why Federalist Society? Where did the name come from? Um, it came from uh, the defenders of the Constitution. Um, so it's the Federalist Papers, um, and Madison, it, Madison Silhouette is um, on our uh, materials because uh, Madison was you know, widely viewed as the primary author of many key provisions of the Constitution. Um, but um, Justice Scalia was very important to us in starting the Federalist Society. At the time, he was a professor. And, and basically, the rest of what happened is that there came to be a national organization that grew out of a symposium that we hosted together at Yale. But we didn't know that we were starting a national organization when we did. But anyway, Justice Scalia was key to helping us start the organization at Chicago, because at the time, he was a law professor at the University of Chicago. And he was my law professor, in fact, for both um, Constitutional Law One, which at Chicago was the structural provisions of the Constitution, and then also for administrative law. But he was also the faculty advisor to our nascent Federalist Society chapter at Chicago. And he gave us a lot of advice about people to invite to the symposium. He also actually, it turned out, was visiting at Stanford uh, uh, one of the semesters that we were getting started and found some Stanford students who were starting something similar and put us in touch. Um, so he was very important just as a practical matter. And then in terms of the ideas, I guess, I mean, I think that um, you know he was just starting to, I mean, I think that, that conservatism in law, you know, did feel like there was something that wasn't right about the way that constitutional law was being done by the courts, but there was some uncertainty about exactly what it was that wasn't right. And so I think Scalia helped develop the really the the modern understanding of what that was, which was not that the court was not following the original intent of the Constitution, but it wasn't. But that it wasn't following the original meaning of the Constitution. Um, Explain that difference for the audience. Yes. It's so, so basically, um, the key insight I think is a fairly simple one, which is that the Constitution is a law, and uh, the words of laws matter. And so, usually, when you try to understand a law, you start by reading it. But sometimes there are things that aren't clear in the law, and so you have to figure out how to resolve the lack of clarity. And ordinarily, you don't think of the way of resolving that as, OK, we're going to just figure out what we think is a good idea and do that. But that had kind of become the conventional way of doing constitutional law, at least as viewed by many in, the, in legal academia. And so Justice Scalia's you know, first insight was, you know, that that's wrong because that's not usually what you do with a written law. But then the second important thing was that um, the critique of this had been that um, people weren't following the original intention of the Constitution. But ordinarily, you don't concern yourself with what the people, what was in people's heads when they were writing laws. You concern yourself with what they actually wrote. And so that is, and, and how a normal, how an ordinary reader would understand what they wrote. And so that was, I think, a key uh, insight that he had that basically got over a very important objection that had been raised you know, by very smart critics of, of the view that, 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 that the Constitution uh, had to be read as originally understood. He was an administrative law professor, not a constitutional historian. How did he come up with this important insight? Um, it started really with thinking about statutes, um, because administrative law, of course, is all about how you read statutes. The charters of administrative uh, agencies are, you know, and what they're supposed to do um, come from uh, statutes. And so in thinking about how to read statutes, he thought, wait a second, the Constitution, you know, the, the way we read statutes, we don't usually worry about how to think about what the people, what was in people's heads when they were writing the statutes. And you know, yes, there's legislative history, but you can't trust it. 
and there are lots of different people who will you know, say different things about what's in their heads. Um, so this is the solution to the problem for statutes. And then he basically took it and applied it to uh, the Constitution. Fascinating. I had not heard that. I did, and that makes the connection intelligible. And that's a really fascinating piece of the puzzle. Kevin, you have written that uh, Judge Scalia believed that he wasn't supposed to improve on the framers' handiwork but maintain it. You quote him in the Hamdi dissent saying, it's not the mission of a Supreme Court justice to make everything come out right and to apply a Mr. Fix-It mentality. And you talk about cases from the Obergefell marriage equality decision to others, uh, to Roe v. Wade, of course, where he seemed to relish the idea of applying what he called a dead constitution rather than a living constitution. Dead, dead, dead. Dead, 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 no, absolutely. It's not a living document. <laughs> um, what, uh, where did this come from and why do you think that, uh, you, you believe that this has galvanized other, uh, others as well. Do you think that this idea of the dead constitution will ultimately triumph over the living constitution? Well, I don't, I don't know, um, but <laughs> I think what, what we start with, I mean, take something like the Hamdi case. So Hamdi involved uh, a guy that was captured, uh, according to the government, on the battlefield in Afghanistan. They found out he was a U.S. citizen, and they brought him back. Um, and he was uh, in a naval brig in uh, Norfolk and then in South Carolina. Uh, whereas the non-citizens were sent to Guantanamo Bay. Um, and it turned out that case came up to the court thinking, what does the government need to show, if anything, to justify their continued detention um, of uh, Mr. Hamdi? And the way the case shook out was really fascinating um, because you had actually Justice Scalia writing for himself, joined only by Justice Stevens, um, basically saying, the Constitution had a solution for this, okay? It's called the Suspension Clause, and the Suspension Clause essentially enables Congress to get rid of federal court jurisdiction during emergencies. But that's the only safety valve uh, in the time of war. Otherwise, you need to treat him like anyone else that you're holding. You need to um, set him forth for trial, uh, charge him, set him forth, or let him go. The, the, we're not going to make up new justifications. Um, whereas you had um, uh, four justices, uh, another four justices, who said, well, the government has to make some kind of showing. Um, but it turned out to be rather vague what needed to be shown and, and what didn't, and what rights you had. Do you have a right to counsel? What sorts of information does the government have to give? I mean, things like that. Um, and then you had, I won't give you the whole lineup, but basically, his view was that a few of them were just kind of making it up on the fly. What makes the most sense? What is a good rule? What is a good role for the federal courts to have? And I think that's a really, that case is a really good example of uh, where Justice Scalia's, I think, legal commitments uh, took him to a place that was unexpected uh, in, in terms of uh, what you might think in, in um, in terms of policy outcomes uh, and the like, I mean, to give you an example, another justice, Justice Thomas, with whom uh, he's often in agreement, was uh, on a very opposite side of that, basically saying the courts had very little role uh, to play. And so what he, what he was against was this idea that we have to make it better. Uh, that, that, uh, and that's why he said, no, Mr. Fix-It um, for me. Uh, we're trying to figure out what we have. And I do think this idea of, uh, a constitutional custodian, right? The idea that you, your job as a judge is to hand it off in as good a condition as you received it, that, that our constitution really is an inheritance uh, and that it's our obligation to, to hand it on. Um, and we might think, you know, custodian, maintenance man, that's not so important, but for something like our constitution, uh, he thought that was a rather exalted function. Beautiful. Okay, Brian, a Briar clerk in a group of Scalia clerks and uh, the chief counsel of an organization that Lee paid a great and I think accurate tribute uh, in the green room. Lee, you said that the existence of the Constitutional Accountability Center is one of Justice Scalia's greatest legacies because Justice Scalia inspired progressives led by this great man and dear friend, Doug Kendall, who passed last year and is collaborating with the National Constitution Center on this wonderful celebration of the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment, Doug Kendall and other progressives said, let's take Justice Scalia at his word. We believe that constitutional text and history honestly applied may in many cases lead to progressive rather than conservative results. And we're gonna be even more principled than 
you know, according to uh, Doug, uh, conservatives in some cases, by separating our policy preferences from our constitutional preferences and applying this originalist methodologies on behalf of what they sometimes call living originalism. So with that big windup, you're playing a really important role in this conversation, Brown. Tell us both about areas where you think Justice Scalia was principled. You've written on the Fourth Amendment. He was a big opponent of NSA surveillance and, and, and broad police searches, but also areas where you think that he sometimes betrayed his jurisprudential principles and did not was not faithful to text and original understanding. Sure. You know, Justice Scalia liked to say that you know, a judge that always agrees with the results he's reaching isn't a good judge. And I think, you know, to him, one of the real benefits or virtues of originalism was that he thought that it constrained judges. You know, it prevented them from just imposing their personal views or personal ideological preferences. You know, they followed the Constitution and what the Constitution said. You know, I, as, as um, Jeff said, you know, I don't think that Justice Scalia was always as constrained by originalism um, as he purported to be and, and wanted to be. You know, I think there were a number of areas in which the text and history, you know, properly applied Led to, led to different results um, than he found you know, in a host of areas from you know, affirmative action um, to marriage equality um, to campaign finance. I think you know, when you look at the Constitution as a whole, the Constitution particularly as amended by the Reconstruction Amendments, it is in its most vital respects a progressive document. But there definitely were areas in which you know, Justice Scalia, I think, got the Constitution's text history right, and that led him to reach results that were at odds with his personal policy and ideology prefer preferences. And I think you know, there are a number of areas relating to criminal defendants um, that are, are good examples of that. And he was very you know, open about that. He would refer to himself as a, a law and order um, type of guy, talking about the Sixth Amendment, so the protection for the jury right, um, the right to be confronted at trial by witnesses against you. you know, Justice Scalia said that you know, once he looked at the original thinking, he was handcuffed. You know, he said, and these are his words, that he couldn't do the nasty conservative things to the country that he would want to do. And the Fourth Amendment's another great example of that. You know, I think he looked at the history of the Fourth Amendment. You know, he looked at the colonists' experience under British rule and their use of you know, so-called general warrants that let them you know, invade people's privacy and look at all of their documents and belongings without any individualized or particular suspicion. And Justice Scalia recognized that the Fourth Amendment was very much born out of that experience. And so you know, in case after case, particularly in his later years on the court, you know, he voted for a robust understanding of the Fourth Amendment um, that respected that history, even if that um, recognition was sometimes at odds um, with the interests of law enforcement. And you know, he not only voted that way, but he would often write really powerful, um, enforceable opinions. I mean, if there's one thing that I think everyone agrees with is that Justice Scalia was a very powerful writer. He knew how to turn a phrase. And you know, he, particularly in dissents, in cases where he um, was in the minority on Fourth Amendment cases, would write really powerful, impassioned um, defenses of the Fourth Amendment and its protections. Um, you know, there was one case about you know, whether the police could take swabs from people's cheeks to get DNA um, after they were arrested for serious offenses. And you know, he said something to the effect that he couldn't imagine that the, the proud men who wrote our basic, the basic charter of our liberties would have been so eager to open their mouths for royal inspection. You know, he recognized the importance of the Fourth Amendment, and, and he recognized the, the constitutional text and history um, that provided for robust you know, protection for it. And I think you know, it's, it's a good reminder, as, as Jeff said, you know, we at the Constitutional Accountability Center believe that the Constitution is a fundamentally progressive document, and that's why you know, we as progressives um, want to talk about the Constitution's text and history and want to debate the Constitution on those terms. And it's why we see you know, progressive justices doing the same. Um, just as one you know, example this term, you know, Justice Ginsburg, who was obviously Justice Scalia's very good friend on the court, you know, she's described herself as an originalist. Um, and in a case involving um, voting rights about how states draw their legislative districts, she wrote a profoundly originalist opinion. She said, we must begin with constitutional history. And she reached a profoundly progressive result, saying that when drawing districts, you need to look at total population to make sure that everyone's votes are represented. That was a beautiful and judicious uh, both uh, tribute to Justice Scalia as well as uh, you put on the table the, the case that in some cases he was less than attentive to constitutional text and history. I also have to praise you. You got that quote about royal inspection of the mouths uh, letter perfect. So that was really, <laughs> really well done. <laughs> Excellent. Steve, let's engage. I want the group to engage Brianna's and the Constitutional Accountability Center's criticism while you know paying this incredible tribute to him and actually applying his methodology, 
they and other liberal critics uh, have said, in some cases, Brianna mentioned affirmative action and Citizens United campaign finance. He was not attentive, especially to the text and history of the uh, 14th Amendment or the Reconstruction history. And I had the incredible honor and uh, magnificent time of a dinner with Justice Scalia uh, a few years ago. And I don't know, after a glass of wine or so, I was emboldened. And I thought, what the heck? I'll just present this challenge to you. And I say, you know, your critics say that Brown versus Board of Education is impossible to reconcile with the original understanding of the 14th Amendment since people stood up in the Congress that proposed the 14th Amendment and said, don't worry, this won't apply to public schools. You know, what's your answer? And he just thought for a moment and threw back his head and said, you know what, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, you are a scholar of Reconstruction. You know this history very well. Do the liberal critics have, is there some merit in the criticism? And what was Scalia's response? So that's a great question. And I feel like there are a number of questions on the table that I need to address. First, I should say that both with the 14th Amendment and constitutional law generally, I think Scalia's mission was to restore the rule of law. He believed passionately in the idea that there should be a rule of law and not of men, and that he thought that the separation of legislative, executive, and judicial power was a critical part of that. He thought it was critically important that judges, above all other people, follow the law, especially the law of the Constitution. And to him, the law was the text as it was originally understood. I think that with respect to the 14th Amendment, he never studied the history of Reconstruction or of the various clauses surrounding the 14th Amendment in a great level of detail. Um, the subject wasn't much studied in law schools at the time that he went to law school. It became a subject of great interest after the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I have written articles using Scalia's originalism to defend Brown v. Board of Education, Loving Against Virginia, which struck down anti-miscegenation laws, the extension of the Equal Protection Clause to cover uh, gender discrimination in the 1970s. And I have an article coming out making an originalist argument in defense of a right to same-sex marriage. I honestly think in making these arguments, I'm drawing on the originalism of Justice Scalia and I'm simply applying it differently than he did because I know more, I think, about the sources than he knew. In particular, um, I think the 14th Amendment, Justice Scalia was extremely loath to consider the meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause in the 14th Amendment. And when the court was invited in a case involving whether the Second Amendment right to own guns shouldn't be incorporated to apply against the states, the court was invited in that case to consider whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment was, in fact, the cornerstone of the amendment, which is what the framers of the amendment thought, and whether that provided the basis for incorporation of the Federal Bill of Rights and for the protection of the anti-discrimination command of the 14th Amendment. And unfortunately, Justice Scalia said he would rather stay, follow stare decisis, and decide incorporation of the Second Amendment under substantive due process because he thought fewer rights would emerge under a substantive due process doctrine than under a privileges or immunities clause doctrine. To me, that's not, that's allowing stare decisis to play too big a role and allowing originalism to play too minimal a role. I think as an originalist, one should look at the amendment, see that the slaughterhouse cases mangled the Privileges or Immunities Clause, overrule them, and you'll discover that most of the equal protection and some, but not others, of the substantive due process cases can be justified on originalist privileges or meaning, uh, privileges or immunities clause grounds. But that would be a conversation that would be worth having. One thing I firmly believe as an originalist is that not only do I think that Loving is rightly decided and Brown is rightly decided, but I throw this out as a challenge to any living constitutionalists in the audience. I think Plessy v. Ferguson was wrongly decided in 1896. And I think the Supreme Court was wrong in, the 18, in 1883 in the Civil Rights Act cases when it gutted the Civil Rights Act of 1875. If you believe in living constitutionalism, 
rights can erode away. It's not just adding rights. And that's something Scalia emphasized time and time again. We had a lot of rights that were won at great cost during Reconstruction. And sadly, those rights were evolved away in the civil rights cases and in Plessy, and they had to be restored in Brown. Brown and Loving and the modern, modern interpretation of Equal Protection Clause simply involves a return to what was the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, in my opinion. Fascinating. Well, really, Steve, as you described, there was a lot packed into that uh, really, really interesting answer. Stare decisis, remember, means let the decision stand. And Steve said, in some cases, Justice Scalia was more interested in preserving previous precedents of the court, in particular those that had read out of the Constitution this really important Privileges as Immunities Clause, and in this sense, let his commitment to judicial restraint and preserving precedent to trump his devotion to the text. Lee, this division between conservatives or among conservatives about whether uh, a conservative uh, approach to the Constitution should focus mostly on enforcing the text of the Constitution, regardless of whether that means striking down a whole lot of laws, or should generally be more concerned about deferring to democratic outcomes, was on this stage on uh, Monday with, where we had an incredible discussion with Randy Barnett, who was here to discuss his really new, interesting new book, The Republican Constitution. And Randy is a devotee of the idea of, of what he cheerfully calls judicial engagement or judicial activism. And he says it's fine for judges to be activists and to strike down lots of laws if that's what the text of the Constitution requires. Justice Scalia took a different view and criticized libertarians like uh, Randy and, and Richard Epstein and instead said that judges should generally interpret the law, not make it, and defer to policy outcomes. Tell, tell us about this important uh, disagreement which continues today and, and, whether, and what Justice Scalia's role was in adjudicating it. So I think, um, I, I, I do think it's, one thing I, let me just um, mention one thing before I answer, get to your question, which sure. is, I, I think that one thing that, I mean, when he said no, not everyone's perfect, and he was talking about, uh, he may have been talking about the framers of the Constitution, but I do think that one thing about some of these questions is that they're hard, and that people of good faith can disagree about them. Mm -hmm. And that when, just having agreement about methodology isn't going to necessarily mean that all of a sudden everyone's going to agree about what the right answer is to a question. So, I, but I think that, that Having, having more agreement about methodology at least helps you figure out what you're disagreeing about, and that's, I think, very helpful. Um, you know, and, and so I don't think it necessarily means that anyone's in bad faith, including Justice Scalia, you know, or, or the people who think that he's wrong. I, th I think that, that you know, uh, sometimes the evidence is, is complicated. Um, in terms of the, the, the question of, of, so the Constitution, um, basically, the, the, the position on the Constitution, you know, depends a little bit on whether you view it primarily as a document that enfranchises majorities or whether view, you view it primarily as a document that protects um, in minority rights from majorities. Because, of course, it does both, actually. Um, and I think that, that you know, at least, you know, in, in his earlier writing in particular, I think that Justice Scalia was, you know, somewhat more inclined to stress the importance of the first point, that the Constitution was a document that primarily gave to the people of the United States the ability to make decisions through their elected representatives. And that's true. But it's also true <laughs> that the Constitution would be a lot shorter if that was all it said. It's pretty short, but it's, it would be a lot shorter if all it did was say, okay, Congress, now you go and decide everything. Um, it doesn't do that. And Justice Scalia actually found, I think, that he cared a lot about the provisions uh, that didn't just say, Congress, you go do everything, too. And I think that you know his original reaction, in part, what, to what was going on was a feeling that the court was making things up and usurping things from the democratic process that the Constitution had committed to the democratic process. But he also did think the Constitution withheld things from the democratic process. And so I think that's what this argument somewhat is. I actually kind of think engagement activism and so on 
uh, are are not necessarily the right term are are, are somewhat somewhat um, polemical uh, ways of looking at this, but I do think that that you know at the root there is kind of this question of what's left to the democracy and what is without from the democracy. Can I add something? Please do, and I want to j just ask whether you think you, you think that this division still persists. In the healthcare case, for example, Chief Justice Roberts cited Justice Holmes, a famous uh, partisan of judicial deference, and uh, Justice Scalia was on the other side. So do, do conservatives, there, there does seem to be a lively debate today about how deferential judges should be. There is a lively debate over how deferential cons uh, conservatives should be, and just Chief Justice Roberts has argued that the Supreme Court should be more deferential than Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas and Justice Alito sometimes called for. You're absolutely right, Jeff. He emphasized in his uh, recent opinion in the, the same-sex marriage case the centrality of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Justice Holmes was a great hero at Harvard Law School where Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia studied. And uh, Justice Holmes is, in my mind, most remembered for his decision in an eight to one court in Buck v. Bell, where he held that the state of Virginia had the, th the authority to compulsorily sterilize people so as to prevent them from passing on genes for feeble-mindedness. Uh, I can quote from memory what Justice Holmes said in that case. He said, the same quote, the same principle that sustains compulsory vaccination sustains the compulsory cutting of the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So that was an example of the Supreme Court not acting, of the Supreme Court letting the political process have its way. And I think it suggests why Randy Barnett is right to think that it's important for the court to step in and protect liberties. It's little known that during the 20th century, 60,000 Americans were compulsorily sterilized. We know about the injustices of Korematsu and of Plessy against Ferguson. We don't know about the 60,000 people who were compulsorily sterilized. Their rights were violated. That, sh that should not have been done. I did want to say two things about Justice Scalia's originalism. First, he said himself that he was a faint-hearted originalist, by which he meant that he would sometimes follow statute where it was well entrenched. And uh, he was quite sincere in that, but it did raise a difficulty, which I think people from the left sometimes question, because sometimes he would seem to favor stare decisis when the original meaning would produce a liberal outcome, but originalism when the original meaning would produce an original outcome. I don't think he was consciously doing it that way. I think he was honestly trying to follow really deeply embedded precedents and not follow less embedded precedents. I also think he never worked out a very good theory of stare decisis, and so uh, that's so something that's sort of left a bit unclear. But a second very important way in which Scalia departed from originalism aside from stare decisis is that he always opposed balancing tests and standards, and he would only rule in areas where it was possible to state a clear rule of law rather than a standard. A rule of law is a rule like the president has to be 35 years old. A standard is a clause that says the president has to be a very mature individual. Scalia, understandably, wanted rules, not standards. And so there were parts of the Constitution that the right wanted him to enforce that he didn't think he could enforce because he didn't think it could be done in a principled way. So many conservatives would have liked to have seen the non-delegation doctrine revived. Explain and what that is. The non-delegation doctrine is a doctrine which says Congress can't delegate too much power to the executive branch. The problem with the court saying that uh, Congress can't delegate too much power to the executive branch is that you'd have to decide case by case by case how much of a delegation was too much. You'd inevitably end up with the balancing test. There wouldn't be a rule and the body of law would be a highly political one. And so Scalia's answer was to abstain. Simply, I'm not going to decide non-delegation cases. The government wins in non-delegation cases. Similarly, I think the reason he didn't want to revive the Privileges or Immunities Clause was because he didn't think there were principled ways 
of enforcing and interpreting it. So to, to his defense, he was an originalist, but he was an originalist who believed in stare decisis, and he was an originalist who would not intervene where the only way you could intervene was with a balancing test that would introduce discretion. He favored rules over standards. If I can say something quickly on the deference point. I mean, I do think it's important to remember that there certainly were, were areas in which Justice Scalia um, was not deferential and was not shy about you know, overruling um, or holding you know, acts of Congress unconstitutional. Um, you know, those were often in areas in which you know, I think he got the Constitution's text and history um, wrong. You know, one area I mentioned earlier was campaign finance. You know, he um, you know, voted in Citizens United, a case that most people are probably familiar with, um, to say that you know, the Congress could not um, prohibit corporations from making independent expenditures um, in support of um, political campaigns. You know, I think this ignored um, a you know, history going back to our founding of distinguishing between corporations and living people and ignored um, the framers' concern about uh, you know, improper, about our institutions of government developing a, you know, a dependence, an improper dependence um, on outside influences. You know, another example um, is the Shelby County case in voting rights um, where the court, you know, he um, joined the Chief Justice's opinion in validating a key provision um, of the Voting Rights Act. And there again, I think they didn't give um, sufficient weight to the 15th Amendment, which empowered Congress um, to enact laws to protect the right to vote. So, you know, while he may have been more in favor of deference than, than some of his conservative colleagues, um, there were plenty of areas in which he was not shy about striking down, about striking down laws. Great. We, I want, Kevin, I want you to jump in, and then I want to get, get to audience questions. Respond. You, you know, what about Brown's charge that Citizens United and Shelby County were well, you, not restrained and inconsistent? Yeah, with let, me start, let me start. Let me start with what, what Steve said, uh, because yeah. um, there's 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 an important part of Justice Scalia's jurisprudence um, that is uh, traditionalist, uh, in addition to originalist. That is, um, and some of this has to do with uh, the tradition of what it means to be a judge and what judicial power is. Uh, and really going back to Marbury versus Madison, uh, there was a recognition that there are some things that are uh, legal questions that go to the judiciary, and there are some things that are political questions that are committed um, to discretion. And so sometimes in something where it's like, we can't come up, we as judges can't come up with judicially administrable standards for a rule of law. It turns out there's law on that that says when you can't do that, that is a sign that you might be dealing with one of these political questions. Uh, and so to give you an example uh, of something uh, that where Justice Scalia found there was a political question, uh, and well, it's another one of these lineups, so I'll try and be brief about this. Case right here out of Philadelphia involving, I mean, out of Pennsylvania involving partisan redistricting, partisan gerrymandering. So uh, the idea is um, states get to draw their districts um, subject to one person, one vote, other constitutional constraints. Uh, and the claim being made was uh, this was done on a partisan basis. Now, it turns out that, that it, by assigning this job to states and to legislatures, of course you're going to end up with partisan considerations. The question for the court is how much partisanship is too much, right? What is an excessively um, partisan sort of thing? Now, four justices said, we don't know, we can't say, we can't figure it out, we don't, can't come up with a judicially administrable standard for that. The other four said, oh, there's a standard, but they each had different standards. Uh, they each had a different test. Um, and then the, the, the last, so you say, well, how'd the case come out? That sounds like a tie. Uh, Justice Kennedy uh, said, well, I'm not willing to say never, um, but since I don't have a standard that any of the parties gave me, then the challengers lose. Um, and so, you know, I think that there are, there's law on this, too, about what the, the judicial, uh, uh, what the judicial role uh, is. In terms of, um, uh, well, uh, remind me what the, what the, what the follow-up question was, because uh, I, I don't want to, or we could just move on, because... Well, to be honest, uh, yeah, that no, Shelby County and Citizens United were not restrained uh, and inconsistent United, with, yeah. so to understand. It's funny, you know, I was just Aside from reading, that, they were really good to see. I was just reading some cases. So um, a, a case called um, Massachusetts Citizens for Life was a case uh, decided when I was 11 years old. So I don't remember it. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, in 1987, uh, the court was confronted with the question whether uh, corporations had free speech rights uh, to, to, to make expenditures in support of 
uh, uh, in support of uh, ballot propositions and the like. Um, and Justice Scalia joined a five justice majority, recognizing that nonprofit ideological advocacy corporations uh, did indeed have such First Amendment rights. The opinion was written by that uh, conservative stalwart William Brennan. Uh, it was joined by, uh, uh, I'm not going to remember all of them, but Blackman, Powell, O'Connor. This is not the usual suspects. Rehnquist was on the other side. So I think the uh, corporate speech is, is more complicated uh, than. Um, than sort of invo invoking Citizens United um, alone uh, will, will get us to. Excellent. Well, we have such great audience questions. They're so substantive, and I want to get through as many of them as possible. So I'm going to address them to one of you just randomly, and others can jump in if they need to. Um, Lee, uh, you know Justice Thomas very well, as well as Justice Scalia. One of our guests asked, what was Justice Scalia's opinion of Justice Clarence Thomas' uh, function and contributions to the Supreme Court? <laughs> Just as Justice, Tom, Justice Scalia was thrilled uh, with, with Justice Thomas. Um, and I think that the, the best work that's been done on this actually is uh, Jan Crawford's um, book about the Supreme Court, where she shows um, <laughs> that uh, although the conventional story was that Justice Scalia uh, or ha you know, before Jan, Jan Crawford's book, the conventional story was that the Justice Scalia, um, you know, basically um, was leading Justice Thomas. In fact, much of the time it was the reverse, and that Justice Thomas essentially, um, you know, uh, developed uh, entire lines of of, of you know uh, jurisprudence where Justice Scalia essentially, you know, originally started out with a different position and then came to view the argument that Justice Thomas was making as correct. So, um, you know, I think he did feel that Justice Thomas was, uh, you know, the person who was, you know, really the closest to him methodologically on the court, and he was very happy to have a fellow originalist on the court as well. So, um, you know, and I think, I think they, they were quite good friends. Great. Steve, you wanted to jump I in as well? I wanted to jump in and say, when Justice Thomas was appointed, Justice Scalia was visibly elated at the clerkship reunion following that term and remained so. I think he was uh, very, very enthusiastic about Justice Thomas's contributions to the court. I personally think Justice Thomas's opinions are some of the best opinions that any Supreme Court justice has ever written in American history. I would add with Justice Scalia, we should remember that he was very close friends with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They always spent New Year's Eve together. He was also a very close friend of Justice Elena Kagan, with whom he went duck hunting. Uh, he was a close friend on the DC Circuit with Judge Harry Edwards, who was a liberal African-American judge appointed by President Carter. Uh, Justice Scalia, most years, hired one liberal law clerk out of four to be the devil's advocate in his chambers so that he would hear the liberal view on things from his law clerks before he heard it from his colleagues. So he was a very collegial person and a very social person, and he formed ties across ideological lines, across all kinds of lines, and I think that's one of the reasons he'll be really missed. We have two or three questions on, uh, there's so many we want to get through. You can, if you need to, you can uh, return to it. but. Uh, uh, several guests asked, how do you think Justice Scalia would feel about the delay in the Garland confirmation? If he were still alive, would he approve of the Senate's delaying confirmation of a new justice until the next president's in office? I think this is time for a very mini condensed constitutional debate. Brianna, if you're channeling Justice Scalia and originalism, do you believe that the Senate does or does not have a constitutional duty to hold hearings? I think it does have a constitutional duty to hold hearings and to give the nominee a vote. I mean, you know, the president, it's in the text of the Constitution, and there's lots of history to support it. The president has an obligation to nominate someone. The president has now fulfilled that constitutional obligation by nominating Merrick Garland. And um, the Senate then has a, an obligation to decide whether to give advice and consent to that nominee. I mean, I think the framers would probably be stunned to see the kind of gridlock we have here. It's one thing, you know, to not get, to decide to vote down a nominee, but to not even give that nominee an up or down vote at all is a pretty stunning thing. I disagree with that totally, I guess. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm so. Can we I, vote? I, I, I think the floor is yours. I, you know, I, I think the president was perfectly entitled to make a nomination. 
Um, I think the, the nomination he made was a plausible one considering the people he looks to, to, to nominate for judgeships. It's not who I would pick. Um, I think the Senate can give advice and consent in many ways, including by not holding hearings and by saying that we're in the middle of a very divisive election season and we think the next president should be the one to make a decision about this vacancy. And you know, the fact of the matter is, the size of the Supreme Court has varied constantly throughout American history. The Judiciary Act of 1789 set the Supreme Court at six justices. Uh, the, uh, President Adams reduced it to five. Jefferson raised it back up to six. It was then raised to seven. Uh, in the 1830s, the Jacksonians wanted to pack the court, so they raised it from seven to nine. In, during the Civil War, Lincoln found it difficult to deal with Roger B. Taney's Supreme Court, so Congress increased the size of the court to 10. After Lincoln was assassinated, Congress didn't want Andrew Johnson to fill any vacancies, so they reduced the size of the court to six. There were seven justices on the court when Andrew Johnson finished his term in office. They voted four to three that paper money was unconstitutional during the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant was sworn in, the court was re increased from seven back up to nine justices, and a year after the four to three decision holding paper money unconstitutional, the two Ulysses S. Grant nominees joined the three dissenters and ruled five to four that paper money was perfectly constitutional during the Civil War after all. And this is not to, even to go into all of the struggles during the Roosevelt years in 1937. So I think that membership, the process of selecting members to the court is one that involves democratic accountability. Vice President Biden, when he was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, clearly said it's not appropriate in election years to fill Supreme Court seats. Uh, Lee and I have a very good friend, Peter Kaiser, who's one of the most talented lawyers in Washington, who was nominated to be a federal appeals court judge in October, a full year, 13 months before presidential election, and the Senate never held hearings or acted on his nomination. There's nothing out of the ordinary about this at all. This is a question that should be settled by the people at the, ele at the election. Well, I just, I just need to say... Rebuttal, I, Counselor, and then we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll pick I this mean, up on May 26th. A, a couple of points. I mean, one, it's all well and good to say that there should be democratic accountability, and obviously that's right, but we have a democratically elected president who has not yet finished serving his term. And it actually is quite unprecedented for a nominee to not be given a hearing or vote. I mean, most nominees, um, I think, have been confirmed within 100 days. Um, they've certainly had their hearing at, at, at this point. And we've had a number of Supreme Court nominees who were confirmed in election years. So what the Senate is doing here um, is, is clearly an abdication of its responsibility, and it is an unprecedented one. And the other point I would make is it's certainly true that the size of the court has changed over time. But an eight-member court, I mean, does produce the prospect of evenly divided decisions, which really does dramatically affect the court's ability to do its job. We've so far this term seen two 4-4 decisions. One of those decisions was in a, a relatively low-profile case, but that 4-4 split left unresolved a circuit split. And what that means is that different people in different parts of the country are being subject to different laws, and a big part of the Supreme Court's job is to prevent exactly that, to make sure there's one uniform rule um, for the entire country. Um, the other case was a much more high-profile case um, about public employee unions. Um, this is a question that, frankly, you know, should, there shouldn't be legal uncertainty about. The Supreme Court decided this issue about 40 years ago, um, but Justice Alito called that decision into question. Conservative activists brought this case to the court, and they've made clear that they're going to continue litigating this until we get a definitive decision um, from the Supreme Court. They, in fact, filed a petition for rehearing asking the court to hold the case and hold re-argument once there's a ninth justice. They pointed out there's lower court cases that tee up this issue. And so we need the Supreme Court to be able to resolve these kinds of legal questions, provide definitive answers, and it can't do that with only eight justices. I'm going to say, just, just <laughs> you'd la last word in the spirit of one intervention each, but remember the question is, what would Justice Scalia have thought? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the, there's a democratically elected president here. There's also a democratically elected Senate, which was elected in 2014, and it's a majority Republican Senate. And the majority of Republican senators have a very different idea of how judging should be done than President Obama does. So, you know, Democratic elected president in 2012, the most recent sampling of the popular will produced a Republican Senate. Um, as for evenly divided just an evenly divided court being a problem, the framers of the Judiciary Act of 1789, as I mentioned, created a six-judge Supreme Court. That's an evenly divided court. 
They weren't worried about this problem. There's a rule when a court is evenly divided, the decision below stands. And as to the law being different in some circuits from the law in other circuits, that's true even when there is a majority on the court because of the Senate. Why do you think it is that federal court of appeals judges in California and New York are more liberal than federal court of appeals judges in Texas and Alabama? It's because senators play a role in confirming judges to those courts. So federalism through the Senate is stamped on the lower federal court system. It's inevitable that there will be variations of federal law in one part of the country from another. And that's not a problem. That's actually a strength of the constitutional structure. Wonderful. A debate of which Justice Scalia would have approved. We will uh, rehearse this in full splendor on May 26th. And we also had a great podcast on this very question two weeks ago with Mike Ramsey and Erwin Chemerinsky. Please check it out. Uh, Kevin, we, I, I, want, I just want to put the questions on the table. You can ignore the questions and respond to whatever <laughs> well, you want. Because you've been, you've been debate, eager to right? jump in, absolutely. <laughs> but we have a bunch of questions about methodology, which are really interesting. Here they are. <clears throat> In applying the originalist approval of the meaning of words guiding constitutional interpretation, who is the ordinary reader? Is it a common person of the time, a political congressperson? Whose meaning should be applied? Why, when there's differing views? And another guest asks, how does originalism take into account the fact that contemporary meanings of words in the English language change over time? Okay. All right, I'll actually answer the question asked. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> After I said to say, Justice Scalia on the nominations would say, I told you so. I mean, this is, this is a consequence of the way the court acts um, in certain areas. Um, and there's very good scholarship showing that in certain areas, the court is a majoritarian institution that as public opinion changes uh, and new rights seem to be the kind of thing that should be recognized, that, that uh, as long as the median justice has uh, the right finger to the wind, uh, you're going to see the law, the Constitution change with public opinion. And so I'd say, you know, this is what you get. Um, as to uh, originalism, I, I, I think uh, there's two, th th those are two very good questions, um, and they're enduring questions. So the question of what counts as the ordinary, uh, ordinary reader, let's start with this. Um, uh, Lee, Lee mentioned Justice Scalia had this insight that the Constitution was a law. Uh, okay, so the Constitution is a legal instrument. And it turns out that um, there's law about how to interpret different kinds of legal instruments. One of the biggest debates in, uh, in, in, the, in uh, the founding and through the, actually through the Civil War, really, is what kind of document is the Constitution? Is it a contract, a compact among the states, in which case there are some rules of interpretation that would be applied uh, to that? Or is it more like a charter uh, for a new government or a power of attorney? And, and maybe it turns out that it's not just one thing, but different clauses are different types of legal rules. So, for example, the Bill of Rights might be, um, uh, certain things might be just sort of codifying pre-existing natural rights, uh, whereas something like, uh, take the, one of the earliest cases involving the meaning of the ex post facto clause, right? So that seems very straightforward. Um, states shall pass no ex post facto law. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very early on. This is, it's this exact debate. Um, do we read this sort of as a sort of just, well, what does ex post facto mean to you? What does it mean to you? And uh, no, it turned out that, that the court resolved this was a legal term. It was used in state constitutions. Uh, it was uh, Blackstone used it, and so you trace it, um, that sort of thing, through the, the legal um, sort of the legal conventions that are appropriate for that kind of thing. Um, and so, um, ordinary lawyer, um, what what are the legal conventions appropriate for making this the kind of law uh, that it was intended to to be? Uh, and and uh, the idea, for example, that the Constitution was intended to fix and anchor certain things is itself a convention uh, that, that um, we may or may not have. Uh, other countries have different kinds of constitutions. Ours, Justice Scalia thought, was the kind that was intended to, to fix uh, certain, um, s certain things. Um, so, again, I forgot the second question. No, that, but, was, um, uh, that, was, that was beautifully done, and we have a lot of other ones, but okay. thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, just t time for a few more, and they're all excellent. Uh, Lee, these two are uh, related. Um, one guest asked, does the, federal, does the Federalist Society believe in legislative intent at all? And the second question is, what was Justice Scalia's view of the administrative state, such as funding for the Affordable Care Act? It goes back to the idea of him as an administrative law professor, but uh, sure. yeah. Um, so the Federalist Society actually doesn't mostly take positions on things. Um, 
And so it probably doesn't have a position. I, 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 you know, I don't think there's a Federalist Society view on legislative intent um, you know, one way or the other. I can talk about kind of what originalists think about that, which may be a better, a better way of um, reframing the question. Um, uh, for just given the federal, the reality of the federal society's institutional concerns, um, I I think that um, the there is you know even you know on most questions there, you know there's still some dispute about about this question of intent among originalists. There are still you know some people who still think that there is a coherent notion of you know legislative intent. Um, I think for the most part. There's a lot of skepticism as to whether a collective body, you know, can form a single intent. Um, but you know, there's some new work being done on this as well, including that we do seem to think that you know corporations can have intentions. And so you know, I think I think maybe is the answer you know <laughs> right now. But I think it needs to be a lot. You know, I think it's a it's a philosophically. It, I think I think it's a more complicated question. You know, than than just sort of okay. You know, the person who introduced the bill said this about it, and that means that the Congress as a whole must have believed that. That's almost certainly not right. I mean, the person who introduced the bill, you know, may be giving his honest opinion about what he thinks, or he may be trying to affect what the court is doing. But in any event, the whole Congress hasn't voted on it, so you can't say that that's congressional intent. Great. We have time for just a few more questions. There are two. Bush v. Gore questions. Uh, one uh, guest asked, you know, although Justice Scalia was frequently asked about the decision, he always said, "Get over it." Did this <laughs> did this give the impression that the decision was political? And another guest says, "Many people claim the Supreme Court determined the 2000 election, but isn't it true that it was Al Gore that brought it, the election to the court?" Steve, as I recall, you had a, a, a principled and interesting, or uh, a, a, a fresh position on Bush v. Gore, was Bush v. Gore consistent with originalism or not? Um, on Bush v. Gore and originalism, I think you can make an argument that Bush v. Gore raised a political question and that the election result should have been decided by Congress counting the ballots and figuring out how to count Florida's ballots, whether to count them as being for Bush or for Gore. Uh, the difficulty is that the Senate was controlled by the Democrats and would have voted that Florida had been won by Gore, and the, Repu the House of Representatives was controlled at the time by Republicans and would have said that Bush had won the Florida's vote. So leaving the decision in Congress's hands uh, wouldn't have produced an outcome. At noon Did, on Didn't the Electoral Count Act, I remember this from the old days, say that in the event of a tie between the House and the Senate with Gore casting a, t uh, you know, a, a vote for himself, then the election would be decided by the governor of the contested state, so Jeb Bush, so would, have Jeb, Jeb Bush would have in the end decided the election. In the end decided the election. Yes. This is, the other thing is, if, if, if none of this were resolved by noon on January 20th of 2001, the terms of President Clinton and Pr Vice President Gore would have ended, and Speaker of the House Dennis Hastert would have become <laughs> acting president. So. And there's, there's every reason to think that this could have dragged on beyond noon of uh, January 20th. That's the benefit I, I will, of hindsight, that argument. I will say this in defense of, what's, of Scalia in Bush v. Gore. Uh, the Warren Court had decided the one person, one vote cases, and it decided that voting rights cases were not political questions. The equal protection principle applied in Bush v. Gore was the Democrat, the, Democrats have sued in Florida to have the undervote recounted in three heavily Democratic counties in Florida. But the undervote is not being recounted in any of the other counties in Florida. And there are different standards being used for counting paper ballots in some of the counties as compared to others. And what the Supreme Court said violated equal protection was they said you can't recount the vote in three counties not statewide and you have to have a uniform standard for doing the count. Right? And that was a seven to two holding. And uh, that seems like a fairly straightforward principle of equal protection law. The person who I think had the best and final word on Bush v. Gore was Jay Leno in 2004, who said that George W. was hoping for a bigger win in 2004 than he'd won in 2000. 
He was hoping for seven to two or six to three. <laughs> There are many more uh, superb questions, but I, we need to wrap up. I, I, I'm going to use this as the last, and um, Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, will originalism continue to be influential in 20 years or, or not? Um, I think it absolutely will be. And I think that you know, more than his impact on any particular area of law will be Justice Scalia's great legacy, that he really changed the way people think and talk about the law across the ideological spectrum. I think uh, we're you know, what might surprise Scalia is where, as I've said before, the text and history of the Constitution, where that focus will lead. I think, you know, if, as justices focus in on text and history, as they look at the document, the Constitution as a whole, um, I think they'll, they will find that it's fundamentally a progressive document and that Justice Scalia's approach is in many, many cases going to lead to progressive results. Uh, last word, Steve, on originalism. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think that Justice Scalia's biggest contribution is reviving interest in the original meaning of texts, and that there will be vigorous debate about the original meaning of the Constitution, and there will be many liberal originalist arguments made and liberal originalist traditional opinions written. And uh, so I, I think it definitely he's contributed something that has permanently changed the nature of the court and the country. Each of you lead uh, short last words on Justice Scalia's greatest legacy. I agree with this, and I think that basically, just um, very briefly, I think that treating, if having the court doing, having courts doing law, you know, is very important to the whole legal enterprise. So I think it goes beyond constitutional law. I mean, I think that it's very hard to have a a, a democracy, or for that matter, you know, anything where courts are doing whatever they feel like is the right idea or a good idea. So I actually think that reviving originalism and, you know, reviving the idea of the Constitution as a law and that that's what the courts are doing has ramifications that go beyond even constitutional law. Beautiful. Last word to you, Kevin. Yeah. Well, Justice Scalia was a poker player. Um, and as a poker player, you know you have to play the cards you're dealt. And um, he had a choice to make uh, when he was on the court, surrounded by people who didn't understand the Constitution the way that he did, right? They had different, different understandings. And sometimes what justices will do is they will start cobbling together coalitions and maybe um, you know, trimming a little bit to get along, to, get, to build a, a coalition, to get enough votes. That was never Justice Scalia's way. Uh, he counted on ideas. He believed in the future uh, that, 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 you would, that, that if our government were working properly, uh, then if you have the right ideas about the Constitution, those will endure. And future generations reading his dissent um, would pick those up. So uh, the jury's out. But I, I think he played a pretty good uh, hand by not counting on the fact of a vote, um, but by counting on the intrinsic persuasiveness of his legal ideas over time. And time will tell. Better than he played poker, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Well, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege uh, to say as uh, the last word that uh, Justice Scalia made constitutional uh, debate and methodology thrilling and exciting and constitutional wonkery uh, meaningful. And the fact that all of you have gathered here tonight and we've had this incredibly substantive debate uh, with vigorous disagreement as well as agreement is a tribute to that wonderful legacy. And for that, uh, we're very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>